and welcome to Scriptonite Reacts. I'm Scriptonite. Today we're going to be watching season two, episode nine of Fargo. This episode is called The Castle. To say I'm excited about the final two episodes of this season would be a gross understatement. I'm really, really excited about the final two episodes of this series, season even. And then like, I keep getting sad at the thought of the season being up and then I'm like, but Carrie Coon is in season three. And those of you who've been with the channel since the beginning or you've watched all of them know that I my very first reactions were to The Leftovers where I completely fell in love with Carrie Coon. So I'm gonna be happy in season three, whatever happens. Even if it's not as good as season two, I'm gonna be happy because Carrie Coon is gonna be in it and Carrie Coon doesn't, just, just she just doesn't do bad projects. This is something I'm learning about her. So very excited. Last episode was <laughs> actually one of my favourites. It, it, it was funny and also scary and surprising and violent. All the things I love in a TV show. All present. Brilliant music again. Fantastic shots. Oh my God. So we had the backstory. We knew that somehow, because we finished, I think it was episode seven, we finished with Mike Milligan just having survived a, an assassination attempt, completely out of favour with Fargo, uh, <coughs> excuse me, completely out of favour with the Kansas City bosses, gets a phone call. Hey, dude, it's your lucky day. I've got Dodd Gerhardt in my trunk. And it's Ed Blumquist. So after that kind of really, oh my God, cliffhanger, get the backstory of how we led up to that phone call, but also more, almost I think more importantly, what happened after the phone call. We had Hansi trying to track down Dodd. We assume D for, for a rescue attempt. On the way, he bumps into a racist bunch of assholes in um, some dive bar and well pretty much only he makes it out unscathed he shoots the barman in the gut he shoots several guys and kneecaps several guys and killed we know he killed at least one of the state two state troopers that arrived so it was pretty violent meanwhile <clears throat> as they're being hunted unknowingly we had Peggy and Ed getting Dodd out of their house over to like his old uncle's cabin in the woods by a lake, Vermilion or something. And Peggy, both of them actually, Peggy and Ed, just growing into beautiful badasses, both of them. That scene where Peggy walks over and basically tells Doug to have some fucking manners and he's, he can't do it. And she just stabs him once like a little poke. And then she think you can see her think, oh, that went all right. <laughs> She's like, in again, and it's deep. She goes right, you know, by the clavicle. She's like, she gets a good, good couple of inches into his chest and she stabs him. And she doesn't flinch. She's like, maybe that'll teach you to have some manners. It's brilliant. That whole thing when then Ed comes home. And I, I swear to God, those three actors must have corpsed over and over and over again shooting those scenes. Because you look in their faces. It... I... And that brings me to why I've realised during that episode why I love this season so much and why it's paid off for me already. I don't even that anything can happen now in nine and ten. I will already be telling people to watch this. If nine and ten are shit, I'll be like, oh, it didn't end well, but you've got to watch these like eight episodes. <clears throat> why it's paid off for me is that it delivered on what I expected. When someone tells me that they're making a Fargo TV series, I need it to feel like 
an extended psychedelic trip with the Coen brothers. And it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what it is about a Coen brothers feel of a show or a, of a film that makes it Coen brothers. But I think it was all on display in episode eight personally. And particularly in those long silences and just awkwardness, which is so funny. And it's, it's really difficult. There's only a few types of shows that are able to do that well. Um, if you like this, I also recommend, if you like that kind of humour, I would really recommend watching Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David, because that is, that is for me the pinnacle of that of that type of comedy because it's supposed to be just a comedy but what we saw in <clears throat> in episode eight it could have been an episode of curb it could have been in a coen brothers film oh like the having him pee in the kettle and <sighs> it was so good so good but of course the laughter had to stop somewhere and um, where it stopped in that episode was Dodd getting loose while Peggy is distracted by the Nat by the Ronald Reagan film, and then Hansy this makes his way discovers the cabin through the window. We don't have to rehash all that. And so, first of all, there's a fight with Dodd in which Dodd once again comes off the worst against Peggy, but he's already lynched. Ed, I thought Ed was a goner, but he, he survives. And then just as you'd be thinking, great, we're going to hogtie Dodd and this, you know, take him to Mike Milligan. Mike Milligan's dribbling, ready to, you know, have his way with you. And then who walks in? Fucking Hansy. So now at this point, he's telling people to sit down and I'm like, shit. No, this really is the end of the road now. They're not... I, I can totally see them surviving Dodd, I just could not see them <clears throat> surviving Hansi. And as Hansi's, like, basically trying to get, talk to Peggy about a haircut, Dodd's on the floor give it, giving it all this about Hansi being a half-breed and a mongrel, and Hansi just looks at him and just goes, Poof, just shoots him cold, cold-blooded, boom, dead. Gone now. Can I have that haircut, please? Didn't even flinch. At this point, Peggy and Ed are like, we are fucked. We just be very nice to the scary man. And Hansy's just about to get his haircut, and Ed's like looking out the window, and then some cool music starts off, and it's Lou and Hank, who I'd completely forgotten were on their way. Totally forgotten. I forgot everything during that episode, incidentally. Like, even when Ed was calling the Gerhards and someone was not taking a message, I was angrily sat there going, who's doing this shit? I'd already seen in episode seven that someone had been calling them. I had to actually go back and recheck my reaction of seven. I was like, yeah, I'm there. I'm clearly reacting to it. I'm taking it in. I'm having a words. That, that's how, how involved I was in episode eight. It was just like couldn't even remember things that had happened and I watched seven and eight together so I was I wasn't it wasn't like I was forgetting something that happened two weeks ago I was forgetting something that happened like 45 minutes ago oh that was amazing and going into episode nine I can't I mean we're headed for the conflagration now everyone is on their way to Sioux Falls or they're already there that's it, period. No one needs yet, I think, to find out that something is going on. Even Constance is up to speed now on shenanigans. Which means I have no more introduction to do because we can get right into this. So, let's have at it. The history of true crime in the West, in the Midwest. So we come to perhaps the bloodiest chapter in the long and violent history of the Midwest region. And here I'm speaking of Luverne, Minnesota, 1979, commonly referred to by lay people as the Massacre at Sioux Falls. What? Ed and Peggy Blomquist were just 29 years old 
on the night their lives changed forever. Ever. Oh my god, that's amazing. Wait. Pause. Just a minute. Was that Martin Freeman doing that voiceover? Play. Oh, that's something else I was thinking. Oh, fuck. Shit, get a gun. You've got all these guns. Wish I mean, that's not a bad idea, but also, yeah, I... Darwin Awards. No, she did. Oh, yes, she did. No, she did. Yes, she did. No, she did. Yes, she did, Peter. I just saw it. All right, take it easy. But why? Just because he's been seen? Oof. I'm probably more sympathetic than I need to be about this guy because I catch it up. Mechante kiyo haya yo. Mechante kiyo yo. Not much is known about Ohanzi Dent. We have no birth certificate, no tribal or family history. What about his war record? He was the Gerhardt's man. Or he had been, until... Jesus Christ, you mongrel. Just shoot these two and get me to a goddamn hospital. What are you gonna do? So this is what all the fuss is about. Yes, sir. Blumquist, Mr. and Mrs. We're realized. <laughs> What's she saying? Says she realized something. <laughs> what the heck are you doing here with, with that one? He came to the house after Peggy and she knocked him on his ass. So I thought <laughs> maybe trade him back to the family and make a deal for us to go. A fresh start. We're on a journey. <sighs> Can we just... <laughs> oh, well, we're skipping down memory lane here. It's <clears throat> worth noting that the Gerhard Indian is out there free, probably calling for reinforcements. So, if I were us, I, I I'd get them out of here. Or cover them in bacon and leave them for the dogs. Fuck off! I stabbed him, the Indian. <laughs> Boy, she makes us look like the gang that can't shoot straight, doesn't she? Pools. Just remember where I knew that fat, stupid cop from. I'm pretty sure he was in the leftovers. Remember when he was like reading out the rules about handing over Gladys's body? Chief Garvey! That fuck. <laughs> What's up, gentlemen? Play. Uh, my plan. It worked. I made a deal for Dodd. With what, the Gerhards? No, they 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 wouldn't. They said they weren't interested. I spoke to this fellow Milligan, and he said he'd protect us if we gave him Dodd. So the meeting set at 8 a.m. They're coming here. Yes, sir, the motor motel. We need to get these two into custody now. Where's the nearest precinct? We can't vouch for the safety of the precinct is the thing. What kind of chicken shit out what? what you running here, JC? Zip it. I don't drive to your backyard and talk about how all your heads are flat. What does that mean you can't vouch for the safety? We got graft, I'm saying. Money changes hands. Used to be Gerhardt money, now it's Kansas City. Oh my god! Crutch. Allegedly. Shit. But, uh, while you bring <clears throat> these two into custody, can't guarantee they won't hear about it down in Kansas City. We wire the redhead. Send them into the meeting with this Milligan fella, get the conspiracy on tape. We're lucky we bust the whole operation. Wow! You're an idiot! No. Son, I'm looking around, and you're outranked here nine ways to Sunday. Look, I've met this Milligan fella. It's not amateur hour. He gets one whiff. It, it Ed's dead before the time it takes to blow your nose. Thought you were Gary Cooper. <clears throat> Turns out you're Betty LaPlage. I'll say that again. Look. Fuck you, Ben. So get with the program. Wow. I need him to die first. I wish Ben Smith was already dead. 
We don't need your conscience. You're half the reason we're in this mess. Look, you're not ready for this. Trooper, not another word. You're not up to the task. This is a war. Don't you get it? I'm responsible for you, and you're breathing because of me. I can't just leave you behind. Son, you turfed. This is on you. Wow. I love him. He fucked that up, but I still love him. He fucked it up for the right reasons. Good to have at least one grown up here, don't you think? Oh, this guy. You two were in the shit just about past your eyes. But there's a rope in my hand. Okay. Do you want to? <clears throat> yeah, we'll take all the help we can get. Good. I'm gonna let you have your meeting with Kansas City. I'm gonna put a wire on you. What's that? A recording device, son. Are you stupid? Hey! Look, you get these Kansas City boys to impugn themselves on tape, and I'll talk to the DA about pleading you out on lesser charges. Well, I want it in writing. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the crossroads separate Mike Milligan, the low-level enforcer for the Kansas City Mafia, was playing a dangerous game. Just hours earlier, he had been targeted for execution, but he had turned the tables on his killers. That was glorious. Well, they never showed up. And now, in a desperate gambit... I'm on my way, me and my man to collect the eldest Gerhard male. He sought to rout the Gerhardt family once and for all. Mm, Betsy. Uh. Molly. Betsy looks like she's about to pass out, guys. She's knackered. That's a beauty. Go show your mum, huh? Oh no, 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 no. I just heard smashing. She's gonna find your mum on the floor. Sylvia's mother says. Come on. Sylvia's hurrying. She's catching the nine o'clock train. Sylvia's mother says. Take your umbrella. Cause Sylvia. No, you can't go home. And they are the oh, says 40 cents more for the next three minutes. Please, this is a Oh no, no one's even there now. Now he's gonna see the fucking dead. Oh no! Oh no! Now he's gonna miss his Percy's dying, isn't he? Oh, this is gonna get me when she goes. Dispatch fast. Smart. He's amazing. No. Don't tell any of them. I'm supposed to escort you out of state. No, so. <sighs> This fellow that killed the clerk, he is wanted in conjunction with a double-digit number of homicides. But Captain Cheney's real scary, so... Uh, I'm gonna have to ask you to get in your prowler, and I'm gonna follow you to the state line. These people are fucking idiots. Listen, Trooper, we appreciate your giddy-up on this thing, but we're not fresh off the boat here. These fellas want to tussle. We're gonna find out a thing or two about what a Dakota man can do. Yeah, Take but... a seat on the bench is what I'm saying, Junior. We'll handle it from here. Over now. It's that music again. I love that theme. 
to live up in town. I can't place it. Your man was out of line. Yeah. Get him! Yeah, he uh, well, he was having a feeling. This this mess has got you, Minnesota. No, Captain Cheney. Army. Yes, sir. Well, then you know it's the generals that do the thinking. And everybody else just says how high. Wow. I had a lieutenant in the war. And he, he told Eisenhower to go to hell once on account of his orders would have got us all killed. And I send that man a card every Christmas. Because I can't. Stay or go. Makes no difference to me. But tomorrow, I'm taking the fight to the enemy. Calm down, Ch Look, he's already on you. Oh. I hate this pissing contest between... Like, sort your shit out. Just focus, be mission focused. This is that scene again. They got him, but he's breathing. Who's got him? Historians of the region have long debated the next two words spoken by the Gerhard's native man. When exactly did he decide to betray the rest of his employers? Yes, he had executed Dodd Gerhardt in cold blood, but at what point did he decide to finish the job? <gasps> Whatever the answer, when Floyd Gerhardt asked who it was that was holding her son, Ohansi Dent said, Kansas City, that Milligan <sighs> fellow. Tracked me to a motel in Sioux Falls. They got numbers, but they're not expecting anything. Send Baron a dozen men. Three times I sent men to do a job. Three times they come back unfinished. I'll handle this myself. Holy shit. Yes. I can't believe it! That was nice. It was their little heights, the kids' heights. Well, no more dog.